everybody. Welcome back to The Joy of Living. So on this episode of Making the Crab Snares, what we're going to talk about are the crab snare loops. So today we're going to focus on the materials that make these loops right here and how we put them together as well to finalize the crab snare. Um, you know, from the cage to melting the lid to all the accessories to finalize it. Again, out of all those items, I think the most important is the loops and materials to make the loops. Here's my experience. I tested out everything. When I first started out, I actually focused on the cage. I thought the cage was the most important. After I got done finalizing the cage and working on the loops, I realized that the loop was actually the most important item on there. Um, it takes a lot to figure out on how to loop it correctly, crimp them correctly, loop them up correctly to where they slide in and hold the crab, um, but doesn't uh, slide in and hold in when you cast it out. It took a lot to figure out. So in this video, we're going to talk about the materials to make the loops, um, how how to make the loops and how to put the loops onto the crab snare okay so watch the rest of this video so when it comes to the loops here's what I've done in the past I tried everything and when I mean I tried everything I literally tried everything um, I first started with weed whacker lines these right here um, I did different size. I did uh, 0.65 uh, 0.8 and 0.9 I did different sizes to see which one works. I did different shapes. I tried round ones, rectangular, triangle, square ones, perfectly round ones. And I tried so many different ones um, just to see what works out great. And along the way, I narrowed down from all the weed whackers that there is one weed whacker line that I like the best. One weed whacker line, one size that works the best when it comes to the loops. And I tried everything. Again, take a look at this description here. There are different shapes on here and you see all the latitude of all the shapes that's available when it comes to weed whacker lines. Now, when it comes to the shapes, the other component is the size as well. Um, there is a 0 0.65, 0 0.80. Um, it goes all the way up and the, the higher it goes, the thicker the size of the line. Now, I tried all almost all the shapes and I tried every Every shape that I tried, I tried all three different size on each shape. So that's a lot of combination that I tried um, to find out which one works out the best. Out of all those lines, the one that I come to find out to work out the best for the Weed Whacker lines is the 0.65 heptagon now that is very hard to find and it's something that you have to look around for um, this is what a 0.65 heptagon shape look like the heptagon shape has roughly about seven to eight points on the shape now the reason why there's so many points and it works out well um, on the shape is because there's less surface area when there's less surface area there's less friction so the friction plays a big key role um, in making sure that you pick the right line for your loops on your snares and out of all the shapes there is too much surface area and there's too much friction so after testing everything out the shape that i narrowed it down to again is the 0.65 the 0 0.065 heptagon shape which has roughly about seven to eight points on them and that it has so much less surface area that it allows the loop to be able to spring in and out very easily so take a look at this description here, and this is where I, you can get it. For me, um, I bought, bought mine at Lowe's. Lowe's tend to have this available. You can buy it online. Now, it's very hard to find it, but once you do find it, make sure you get a lot of it because th this is not a shape uh, when it comes to weed whackers that everybody used. So it's very rare, and they don't make a lot of it. So when you do come across it, make sure you, that you buy enough of it. When it comes to the weed whacker, um, point. 065 heptagon shape that's the one you want to use everything else let me tell you it's worthless okay it's not even worth it so that's one um, I, along the way the weed whackers work great but it wasn't the best and that's what my goal was when I first started out was what was the best material to make the loops so I continue looking I tried mono so mono uh, filament um, lines and I tried uh, 80 pounds, 100 pounds, and 150 pounds. So three different weight size uh, for the mono lines. So out of all three, when I come to find out the mono lines, they don't work out too well. They they spring up, they close up very quickly, they don't last too long, and they don't work too well at all. So uh, with that being said, the mono lines, check them out, no good. 
Now, the next one I tried was the fluorocarbon um, leader lines, okay? And I tried three, 80, 100 pounds, and 150 pound fluorocarbon lines. Tried all three, same result as the mono line, no good at all. There's no spring action to the loops. All it does is spring out, close this, and it doesn't last too long. So these mono fluoro, throw them out, no good at all. So along the way, I tried, I thought that, you know, at this point, after I tried these combination, again, three different size for the mono floral and three different size of each shape for the Wee Wacker lines, I figured, you know, it's, it's, it's out of luck. There's no way I'm going to find a line that's very good enough. And then along the way, I talked to some people um, and then um, did some more research and just, you know, just going about it. And then one day I came across these lines right here, the Hard Rock uh, Mason line. And these are specially made by the Mason Tackle Company. Here's their information. Here's where you can get the line. But this is the company that makes these lines. They're the only one that I know of that distribute them. And out here on the West Coast, there's probably one or two retailers uh, that help uh, distribute their lines. But besides that, they're not um, easily available. So you order it, but they're pretty cheap compared to what I've been using so far. Uh, that actually works out well. So when it comes to the Hard Rock Mason line, when I first got it and tested it out, Again, same thing with like I did with the mono and the floral. I got an 80 pound, 100 pound, and 150 pound one. Okay, and these hard rock mason right here. Again, take a look in the description. So far, I'm still testing out, I'm still looking, but so far, right now, the result is these hard rock mason lines, they're the best one. They're the best one to make your loops when it comes to your uh, crab cage. So I recommend go online, order your Hard Rock Mason line, and they're going to work best for you. Now, 80 pounds, 100 pounds, and 150 pounds. What weight is going to work best? I tried all three, okay? 150 pounds. Now, if you make your loops like 15 inches wide, uh, long and make it very bigger than this, roughly about twice the size of this, it'll work out well. Uh, no problem at all, but you don't want to make it that big because you can't, you know, the crab just go right through them. Now, when it comes, so when it comes to 150 pound line, um, it doesn't work out too well. The 80 pound, the 80 pound is too light. Um, uh, you can use it, it'll work out for maybe one or two use, but after that, the spring is no longer there and you have to redo the line or, you know, take the tip. In my other video, where I show you to dunk it into hot water so you can um, renew the uh, spring again on each of your loop after every use. So check out that video as well. But 80 pound hard rock mason, they don't they last too long. So that's, that's the recommendation right there. I would leave that one out. Now, when it comes to the 100 pound hard rock mason, that to me works the best. Uh, this is my snare right here, and this is what I have on here. I have a 100-pound hard rock mason. So that line right there tends to work the best for the moment as of right now. Now, out of all my research and out of all my usage, again, I narrowed it down to two um, lines. The 0 0.065 heptagon shape and the 100-pound hard rock mason. One of these two, you can't go wrong. They'll work out well for you. Okay, so for the rest of the video, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do these loops and how I put the loops onto the cage. Okay, so the first step into making the loops is first we have to cut up uh, the lines into the length that we want. Between 12 to 14 inches is what I use. Now this is what I mean by between 12 and 14 inches. Now when I cut the lines, Again, this is the Hard Rock Mason, 100 pounds. The Mason Tackle Company, they only sell these in 50 yards. So 50 yards is the only ones that you're going to be able to find. So for a 50 yard row, it's not too bad at all. You can make probably between 10 and 15 snares, um, depending on how long you cut your lines. So this is what I mean by 12 to 14 inch uh, lines when you make your loops. Remember that anytime you make your loops, you're going to end up snipping off a little bit at the ends. So you want to take that into account as well. So if I want a 12 inch loop, I'm going to cut a 13 inch line in order to get my loops at 12 inches. And that's what I mean by keeping that little extra in mind as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to get a ruler, okay? And it's 12 inches. Then I'm going to go ahead and add another inch on there. And that's where I'm going to cut my line. So that's the first thing you want to do to your row. Let's go ahead and continue cutting. 
Let's try that one more time again. Measure it out 12 inches. Add one more inch on there. Go ahead and cut it and you're good to go. Now, at first, it's gonna look crazy. You're gonna see some crazy, crazy lines. They might come out like this. It might come out all swirly. It might come out all twisted. Don't worry about that, because in the next couple steps, I'm gonna show you how to straighten those out, okay? Right, actually, to make your life a lot easier, after you cut it, throw into a paper bag. I have a paper bag here, and after you cut it, you just throw it in there, make it so much easier, okay? So, let's cut the rest of this. So these right here, these are my leftover lines that I used to try um, and make my loose with in the past, the test trial. Um, they didn't work out too well, so instead of just throwing away and wasting it, what I do is I reuse them to make my leader lines right here. So this leader line is actually from my 0.65 um, star shape that I originally used that didn't work out, so the star shape doesn't work out too well. So instead of just throwing away, I use that to make my leader lines. And let me tell you, these make great leader lines. Tremendously awesome. So don't waste them. You don't like them. Go ahead and use them for your leader lines. They work out great. So after you're done cutting it up, this is what it looks like. All cut up into 13 inches. And this is the next step. So what you want to do is boil some water, okay? Get you a nice baking pan um, and get you another one so you can dry it out. And I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do in this step. Okay, so when your water boils up, go ahead and turn on the stove for this pan. Okay, and then you wanna go ahead and pour the hot water. Into the pan, all right, and get it enough to where it doesn't spill over. There you go. Okay, so not much. And then what you want to do is grab some of the lines that we cut. So this is the hard rock mason lines that we cut. So just grab uh, about you know five or six of them. Um, you don't want too much in there at one time. And once you grab about five or six of them, and be a little tricky because they hang on to each other. <clears throat> you see how they're all round? So the reason why we do this process is to go ahead and put some durability back into the line as well as straighten it out. So we can go ahead and make the loops um, the way we need it to. So as they drop in, watch how the line straightens out. See that? See how it uncurls and go back into a straight line the way it's supposed to? And then grab you some tongs and go ahead and mix them up, uh, straighten them out. Make sure that all get in the hot water. Okay. And then just for a few seconds, like five to ten seconds. And once you do that, take it out, put it into a sheet, okay, with some uh, paper towels and let it dry off. And you want to continue doing that. So keep doing that until uh, you do the rest of the lines. Now, in my other videos, what you're going to see in my video, um, uh, refurbishing crab snares. I'm going to show you why I do this, and I do this with my uh, snares that I use too. So after I use my snares for the day, I come home and I boil a hot pot of water, okay? Um, big enough to fit my snare in there. And after the water is boiled just like this right here, I dump my snare into the hot water. And the lines will go ahead and straighten back out. Watch my videos on how to refurbish snares, and I'm going to show you what I mean when I refurbish my snares after I come home. I dip it in hot water. Um, and you see how my snare strain back out the way it's supposed to in the loop. So again, um, about 10 seconds. Make sure it's in the hot water. Okay, every part of it. Take it out. Dump it into the pan. Let it dry off. And you want to keep doing that.
Okay, so once you do that at the end, this is what you have. Right there. All straightened out. Unlike before, where it's all curled up. All right. Okay, so after you temper your lines in the hot water, you know, sometimes it doesn't always come out the way you want it to. We want it to come out like this straight out but you know it, sometimes it doesn't work out like that for you um, for whatever reason so if your line somehow after you dip it in hot water and it comes out like this this or this I want you to know it's still good to you so you can still make your snares from these it's not a problem at all so I don't want you to throw it away okay so now you know the goal is to get it like this so if you do exactly what I showed you you cut it individually you use a pan that's big enough uh, to pour the hot water in and temper this to make sure that it sp uh, springs out straight so there's enough room in the pan you should be able to get this right here but just in case you don't and you get these shapes right here i don't want you to throw it away and think that you can't use it okay so it's still good all right so once you have your hard rock 100 pound mason line ready to go what else you're going to need is you're going to need a pair of dikes some pliers your cage with the melted lead already on there and you're going to need these crimp sleeves okay um, these are the ones that you're going to attach your line to and crimp them up in order for your line to stay attached okay so once you have that you're ready to go now let's talk about the crimps and the sleeves for a moment okay these right here these right here the ones that I'm using for the hundred pound hard rock mason the size that I'm using is 1.5 to 1.6 millimeters or 1 16th they're the same thing okay so let's take a look at my Amazon account and let me show you where I went ahead and ordered it. So again, um, it's 1.5 to 1.6 millimeters or it is 1 16th. Now I tried different ones in the past and they don't work out too well. When it comes to the crimps, I use two, okay? I use the hourglass. See how it looks like an hourglass? Okay, and I also use the oval. Okay, so uh, it's just a straight oval. So these are the two sleeve crimps that I use. Okay, they're both, both of these, the size is still 1.5 to 1.6 millimeters or 1 16th of an inch. And that's what you want to go ahead and buy. Now, these aluminum crimping loop sleeves, um, ferro cable. Um, they are they called a lot of things so what you want to do is look and make sure you get the right ones now when it comes to these uh, crimps and these sleeves when I first started out I actually started out with the electrical ones so I use these electrical crimps in order to um, uh, crimp my uh, line and my loops onto my snare now after a while these didn't work out too well you know, I always have to cut them or I have to uh, use something to open up that little space in there in order to make it big enough for the line to go ahead and uh, fit in. Um, so there was too many things that I had to do. And of course, you know, these as well. And these are the other ends where it slides in and out. So I use this as well. Now with this, you know, it works great when it comes to the line. So that way it can go, you know, like this part right here, how it goes in and out. So that normally that's where I have it. So it goes in and out. Over time, this right here, because it's metal, it's going to cause abrasion to the line. And it's going to cause it to uh, get very bumpy. And then the line is going to be a little bit harder to close up. So over time, I come to find out that these don't work too well. So I opted out to go ahead and just you um, loop it up to make sure that the Hard Rock Mason line is the same one that I use as to loop it up, as you see right there. So... I stopped using these uh, after I found this and when I found this I found it to work so much better and so much easier but it wasn't as easy at first at first I had to find the right size and it took me a while to find the right size like I tried 1 32th of an inch um, I tried the 1 8th of an inch um, so you know I tried different sizes in order to get the right one after I figured out the right size um, then the two shapes of course the hourglass shape and the oval shape what I come to find out when it comes to which shapes to do the best at first I was using the hourglass you know to do everything and it looks like it's a little bit thicker and then once I got used to the oval I realized that the oval is a lot better when it comes to the loops okay 
when it comes to the loops so when it comes to the oval size I use those for the loops now when it comes to the uh, hourglass I use that for my leader line okay so that's my leader line right there unfortunately these right here won't fit into the sleeve it's a little bit harder um, so I get the hourglass even though it's the same size um, it's spaced out so it's a little bit easier for me to put my leader line so moving forward the oval ones are the ones that I use to do the loops on the cage and the hourglass shaped one is the one that I use for my leader line and it works out so well all right, so now that we have everything that we need, let's go ahead and start making our snare and putting the loops onto our snare here. Um, keep one thing in mind when you're doing these snares and these loops, which end is the heavier end, and that plays a big difference throughout your whole entire process. You always have to keep that in mind, okay? This is my heavier end, this is my lighter end. So my heavy end right here, this is the end that's gonna shoot out. Um, it's heavier on one side, so that way it can cast out further. Um, for example, just like this right here. Here is my heavier end. Okay, here's my lighter end. So when it's like this, I throw it out. The heavier end is going to shoot out and it's going to cast a little bit further. So that's why it's very important because your heavier end on the opposite side where it's lighter is where your leader line is going to go. And then it's going to dictate the directions of your loops and where they should face. So that plays a big difference because your loops can face to the left or it can face to the right. And that plays a big difference because if you face the loop on the wrong side, you're not going to get the snare that you want. And I'm show you what that means later down in this video. So keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to the line, it is natural. See how it's, it's curved. So, so it's going that way. See that? So it's going like this. Okay, so that natural curve, it is so natural for us to go ahead and get a line and crimp it, fold it, sorry, and fold it in the direction of the curve. You know, um, this is where we stick in our line for the loop to snare the crap. You see that? So it's so natural for us to do that, to, to go and fold the loop with the natural curve of the line. See how it's all going straight up like that. So unfortunately, what I learned when I did this at the very beginning is when I put my line in, it, it drags. See how it drags against the loop and you don't want that. So what's going to happen? It's going to cause it to not close correctly or it's going to close and it's going to get stuck and it's not going to spring back because it's rubbing against the line and you know it's so natural for us to do that that we tend to forget that um, the anatomy of doing this we have to make it to where it's the line is going in and out without touching the side walls of the loop you know um, and that's what we want so that's the lesson that I learned, and I believe that that is the golden rule and the number one thing about making loops. Like if I had a number one secret, that is my number one secret when it comes to making an effective loop. Now, keep in mind, when I first started out, I spent my first trials focusing on the cage. I spent months focusing on the cage. I wasn't really worried about the loop. And then when I perfected my cage, I come to realize that my loops were not effective and I wasn't catching as much crabs and I was losing more crabs. And then I try to figure out why. And when I took a look at my loops, I figured out that they were made incorrectly, facing the wrong way not crimp correctly um example uh, just like this right here when i naturally fold it like this and stick it in you know my line is rubbing against the, the, the loop so so it's not the most effective so after some observation and trial and errors i fixed my loop that's my number one secret is when you have a line natural curve right okay so so it's a natural curve line the end of about one inch in, you want to bend it 90 degrees from the natural curve. So from here, you see that? You want to bend it that way, okay? And then you have that. 
<laughs> so when you stick it in, you see your line, see a natural curve, and see how it's about 90 degrees when you bend it, you stick it in, your line is not rubbing against it. Let me see if I can get back. See that? It's not rubbing on the side wall. It's going in and out, and it's looping up perfectly. Okay? Because it's not rubbing against the wall. And you make your loops at one end. You don't you want to make it big enough for the line to go in. You don't want to make it too small. Because if you make it too small, let's see if I can make this smaller here. You know, it's gonna rub against the loop and it's not gonna have much space to snag in to tighten up the loop. Okay, so it's gonna be hard. Now you don't want the loop bigger than your sleeve. See that? So that right there, your sleeve, you don't want it bigger than that because you don't want your loop to go in there. So you want your loops bigger than your line to where it can go in and out comfortably without getting snagged up, but you don't want it bigger than your sleeve either. So that is the key to making these loops, okay? So let's go ahead and we're gonna do six of these. So first, get your line. You see the natural curve? See that natural curve that it has? You stick your sleeve in. From there, you bend it 90 degrees. And then you stick the end into this sleeve. And you have that. See that? So here's the curve. And that's the hole that it wants to go in. That's what you want. Okay. So before you do that, make sure that it's bigger than the line, but it's smaller than the sleeves. And over time, you're going to be able to eyeball it, no problem. And then you want to crimp down twice, once there on top and once on the bottom. And that's what you get. Okay. And then you're going to have some excess at the end. You want to chop that off. Okay. Let me see if I can focus here. See how I trimmed it? Okay. So you want to trim it down a little bit. Okay. So you need six of these. So you're gonna do six of these right here. And you got six of them, okay? In California, by law, you got, you are only allowed six loops onto your snares. Now there is no size limit on the loops, but you cannot have more than six. Um, you can have less. You can have one loop on here if you want, as long as you have no more than six. Okay, so that's California regulations. When it comes to my snares, I like to have my loops in certain places and certain directions. And it's, there, there's a reason why I do that. So first is where I place the snare. I place the loops on the corners and one each in the middle. Now there's directions. The loop can face to the right or it can face to the left. I don't know if you could tell the difference there. When we pull the crab, it's like this. The heavier end, okay, the lighter end. And when we pull on the snare, the crab is coming from here. So the crab is right here. When we pull in this direction, we want to make sure the loops are facing that direction to where it can snag easily by going that direction. So when it comes to trial and errors, what I come to learn is these bottom ones, they tend to snag the smaller legs of the crab. So this is where we drag it along the bottom and then we grab the end of the crab leg and this facing out when it comes to the bottom one by having this 
in the middle, it holds a lot better than if I had switched them in a different direction. If I switched them, they wouldn't be as effective on that side if they were like this. Okay, try it. Test it out yourself and you know exactly what I mean. So when it comes to the loops, the bottom ones, the part that springs in has to face the inside. And it's the, these two loops are facing opposite of each other. This one right here is the loops are the one that springs. It's on the outside. See that on the outside. And it goes down like that. The top ones are on the inside, just like the bottom ones. See how the springs are on the inside of these two? Okay. So those are the directions that I always have my loops. And it works out well for me. So when it comes to the loops, let me tell you, I tried many different ways to get it onto the snare. Okay. Um, I tried weaving it. That's where you go in, out. Okay, just like that. And see that bar right there? You're going to wrap it around by going back in and then coming back out at the bottom. Okay, and that's one way to put on uh, your uh, your uh, loops onto your snares. Okay, and then for me, that's an ending step that I do for all my snares anyway. Now with this, the problem with this style is that it takes a little bit longer than the one I'm about to show you. That's one. Two, it doesn't, when you cut the loops, you don't want it to you know, be all crazy in every direction. You want to control the direction of your loop. It is, this takes skills to get it this nice, okay? How it's all organized and patternized and laid out and everything, okay? So that takes skills. But let me tell you, what you don't want is like, let's say the, 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 the loops go like this and the rest of your loops is straight out like that. You don't want that, right? So you have to make sure you do it correctly. So with this, it takes a little bit longer, okay? And it's not as effective as the ones I'm about to show you. So that's one way, okay? But I don't, I stopped doing that. I don't do that anymore. Um, um, same thing, uh, another weave where you go horizontal rather than vertical as when, as far as weaving in and out. Um, and that'll give you directions on the loop. Um, remember, my snares, they come differently. You see how I uh, take a look right here? You see how I have the dragonfly is uh, when the loops are standing up and they're flapped out? That's my dragonfly, okay? The one I'm about to show you is my butterfly one. So uh, there's different ones. And after this a video and these tutorials, I'm going to throw out a bunch of videos on how to make each one of my individual snare. When it comes to the different cages, in the different style, I'm gonna make a video for each one. So that way you say, you know, you get to pick and choose. I like that cage and that style. That's the video I'm gonna watch to go ahead and make my snare. So I tried that way. That's one. Um, I tried strapping on. So, you know, having the line just directly onto the cage um, and being able to strap it on. So that way the loop can stand out something like this. Okay, so I tried that too. Again, same thing. It's hard to get the direction you need it to um, unless you get uh, more materials to where you can uh, epoxy it, um, tube it up um, and redirect the direction of the uh, line. So that way it can pop out where you need to. It's just more work, more tools, more time. Again, time, cost, we want to cut it down, but still make it effective, okay? Um, I tried a bunch of things. I tried, you know, these crimps right here. I tried putting them in, okay? Um, so that way, when um, I loop them up, it's already um, looped up like this when I uh, put it in. So I tried it that way as well, and then I crimped the line with the cage, so they're all connect, uh, connected with the clip. Try that as well. Um, unfortunately, when the line goes bad, it takes a, a, a hard time to break this open. And then when you do, it damages the cage. Um, and then, you know, it, it's just no good. So it, uh, it's not the best when it comes to changing your line. So I don't do that. So try that as well. Another way I used to attach the loops onto the snare was to wrap the loop around the wire and have it spring out. So, you know, I would go ahead and have this end right here, go around one wire, and then wrap it around again twice before I crimp it. So once, a little bit harder. Um, you see, it takes a little bit of time. So wrap it around, 
and twice and I'll use ply so it'll make it a lot easier for me but I'll wrap it around twice onto one wire I used to do this okay wrap it around then I would tighten it up and then attach it to the sleeve and crimp it in and that was another way that um, I attached the loops I would just wrap it around twice so I did that as well again it's a good way of doing it however it takes a little bit longer and the layout trying to have it leveled doesn't always work 100%. So that's another reason why I don't do this um, style anymore. So that's another way that I attach loops onto the snares as well. When it comes to the corner loops, I tend to put them lower to the bottom. So they're on the first tier of the snare. Now, when it comes to the middle one, I'm gonna put it on the second tier right above this divider line, but dead center. And that's where my loops are going to be. So when it comes to the corner ones, I'm going to poke a hole and make enough space in between. There's two, uh, there's two um, uh, wires right there. Poke a hole in between them. I have to make enough for the line, this line, to be able to fit in. All right. So that's all you really need. Now, when you're doing this, be very careful. You don't want to put too much pressure. When you put too much pressure and your screw driver slips, it's going to dig deep into your skin. It's going to hurt. Okay. Now, I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but but just trust me, I know. So don't push it too hard. Um, if you need to, go, go get some gloves so it's a little bit safer. And sometimes you don't even need to poke it because the hole's already big enough. Okay. So you're good to go. So you have your snare, you have your loop. You're going to stick. See how it naturally wants to go in? And it doesn't get dragged along the side walls of the loop. You're going to put a sleeve in. Okay. Now, again, the natural curve is like this. See that? See on the side? The natural curve is like this, okay? At the beginning, this end right here, we, we bent it 90 degrees. This time, we're going to bend it with the curve. And it's going to be one inch. And you're going to bend it with the curve, just like that. See that loop right there? And how again, one inch loops. And then you're going to pinch it down as tight as you can. And it comes out looking like that. See that? It's bent with the curve. And then you have your sleeve right there and your loop okay and again this is the reason why you don't want this loop right here that loop to be bigger than your sleeve you don't want it to go past it otherwise it gets stuck when you're trying to snag your uh your crap this is the heavier end right here so i'm gonna keep that in mind so i know i place my loops correctly so with the heavier end the leader line is going to go on this side so therefore on this end the loop is going to face on the inside at the bottom. So I'm going to stick it in and then I'm going to use some pliers to help me guide the leader uh, to guide the hard rock line, the one that I bent. Let's see if you can see that there. It's a little bright. See that? See how I grab onto that end and I'm going to push it into the hole that we created in the corner. See how it comes out? All right. And just pull it a little bit, lay it out. Okay, so you crimp your sleeve is on this side. See that? And you bent. Okay, so you get something like this. See that wrapped around the line. Um, then you stick your crimp. I'm sorry. Then you stick your sleeve into the other end and push it all the way in as close to the cage as possible. So you want it tight. Mm -hmm. And you see how you have two lines now? Let's see if I can go ahead. Now, let's take a look here. You see you have two lines now? See that? You don't want them to overlap because it's going to cause it to turn um, in the direction that you don't want the loop. You want the loop straight. And what I mean by straight is this. 
See how it's straight, almost straight, straight enough. Okay. See, see how it's perfectly straight, and it's not like let's say like this. You see that? The reason why that's like that is because the way we put it on, the way we bend it, how we bend it, where we bend it, and the way we crimp it, and the way we um uh, uh what's a good word for it? The way we tamper with the loop a little bit before we do a final crimp um onto the sleeve, it creates a straight image. Okay, rather than um, all bent up in different directions. So we want it straight. So with this, again, when we push it in, take a look. These two lines right here. Let me see if I can go ahead and clear this up a little bit. There you go. So again, those two right there, you want to make sure that they're not overlapped. Because that plays a difference in the leaning of the loop. And you don't want it to lean. And then you want to push your sleeve closer to the cage as much as possible okay and then you're going to take your pliers and your dikes and then what you're going to do is with your pliers you're going to grab those double lines that came out that i showed you earlier with your pliers so with your dikes you're going to be on the outside of your sleeve you're not going to crimp it down yet, okay? So you're just going to hold it in position. And then what you're going to do is you're going to pull these two apart like this in opposite direction in order to get the sleeve closer to the cage as much as possible. So you're going to pull down the pliers on the line. And then you're going to hold down the sleeve with the dikes and you're going to pull them in different direction. And when you pull it tight enough, crimp down on the dikes to get the lines to stay where it needs to be. See that? So let's see if I can get a close up here. See how close that sleeve is against the cage. And that's what I mean by putting the dikes on the outside of the sleeve. Okay. So it gives you room to push the sleeve all the way in. And then this is the double line right there that you are holding on with the pliers to pull it in opposite direction to tighten that up. Now you see how it's leaning down a little bit. So before I do the final crimp, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make sure that I cut off the little excess. Okay, and that's the reason why we cut 13 inch lines for 12 inch loops. The reason why is because after you snip off the little bit at the ends and after you bend them twice, they come out to like 12 inch loops. So you need to cut 13 inch lines to get 12 inch loops. And if you want 14 inch loops, cut 15 inch lines. Simple as that. So with that, you see, we want to make sure it's straight, right? And then you see how it's sloping down a little bit. So because it's sloping down a little bit, I'm going to bend it up a little bit before I do the final crimp closer to the cage on the sleeve. So I'm going to crimp it down one more time. So we have a top crimp and a bottom crimp. Okay, and that will hold in place. See that? So two crimps, and then take a look. See how it straightens out? Okay, and there's still one more step to make it perfect, so we're not even at the end yet. I'm going to do it one more time. And then after that, I'm going to speed up the video towards the end. Okay, so again... Loop it in, put it in the sleeve, bend it with the curve one inch, push it down tight, then you have that. Remember which end is the heavier end and know where your line is going to go. So again, this is the bottom, so the loop is going to face inside. I'm going to take the pliers that will help me guide the line through the hole. And then I'm going to stick the end 
into the sleeve. Let me tell you, I know it's, it looks like I'm struggling right now. <laughs> All right, let, let me stop being so tutorial, okay? I know I'm struggling right now, or it looks like I'm struggling. That's because I got to record this, man. I'm like, y'all y'all know how hard it is to do this and have to record at the same time to get a good image because it, it, when I do it, I'm on the table like this, right? So I could do it a lot quicker, but you don't see anything. That's not a good view. Or you see my hand. You don't want to look at my hand. You want to look at all this. You see that? So, so I have to twist, you know, and try to get a good angle so y'all can see. Man, and so, so it looks like I'm struggling, but it's not hard. So I don't want it to deter you from doing it and make it look like, man, if he's struggling, I know I'm a struggle. I'm like, look, I'm only struggling because I got to do a video. If I wasn't doing the video, I'd be on the table like this, you know, and it'd be real quick. I know exactly where I need to go, what I need to do. Um, and I have the table to support me, so I'm not moving around. Well, what? You know, and got it. Snip, snip. Make sure it's lined up. See how it's good and perfectly straight. Let's see if we get the angle right there. And then before I do the second crimp, make sure everything's good. Got my second crimp in. See that? Boom, man. I'm done. See? So if I didn't have to do the video, you know, it'd be, I, it, it wouldn't look like I'm struggling. <laughs> That's the only reason why it looks like I'm struggling. All right, so let's do the other one, and I'm going to speed up the video to do the last two corners, and then I'm going to slow it down when I do the side loops, okay? Okay. So I just got done with the corners, pretty even across. There you go, looks better from that angle. So it's pretty even across. Um, let's do the side. So with the side, it's the same thing, but keep in mind that when I do the corner ones, see the bottom, I put it at the very bottom, first tier, okay? But the second middle ones, I put it at the top tier, dead center in the middle. So count it evenly, dead center, top tier, in between the top line right here. Same thing. Put it in the loop. Put you on a swivel. Bend it with the curve. One inch. Push it down tight. Keep in mind which end is the heavier end. Okay. So this is the heavier end right here. So with this. I want it to face down like this. I don't want it to face out. Okay. I don't want the loops to be in. So when it's this right here, I want it to face down. See how the loop is on the outside? That's what I want. I don't want it to face the other way where the loop is on the inside. Facing down. So keep that in mind. Um, put on the top. So again, the more you practice, the more you see the difference and the easier it gets for you. Okay. Let's get a close up here. So that's what you want. No, it's close up. Let's get a very clear close up and see what we can. Okay. See how close it is to the cage? That's what we want. And because I push it so close to the cage, I don't even need to um, pull it with the pliers. I'm just going to ahead and crimp it down. Cut off the excess. Make sure it's straight. Before I go ahead and do the second crimp, turn it in place, and boom. You have your loop for the center. And see how it's elevated a little bit compared to the bottom one? That's what you want. Uh -huh. All right. And again, there's another step, a final step to make it look even. Um, 
down flat, straight, synced, synchronized, pretty. Okay, so there's steps. There's one more step. Okay, so that's what it looks like before the final step. Okay, not too bad. So one more side. There you go. And that's how you put loops onto your crab snares. Okay. And there's one more step. Take a look, watch the next steps here to finalize the snares. All right. So once you get done uh, putting the loops onto your snares, you want to check it to make sure that it's even. Or always remember which end is the heavier end. Okay. So this is my heavier end right here. Um, and I'm going to make sure I remember that. Um, so the one I straighten it out. I'm going to put it closer at the bottom and then I'm going to straighten this out to get as close to that loop without touching it. Okay. So you want to have a little bit of distance and then I want to push this over a little bit as well. The reason why you want to leave a little bit of a gap on the lighter end is because remember you have your leader line. Okay. You have your leader line in the middle, so you don't want it too close to where your leader line is touching and causing trouble to your loops. So you want to have that space to have your leader line freely open. Um, so that's the reason why the heavier end, put it closer and then start bringing your loops down and make sure that it's as even as possible when it comes to that right there. You know, this one is tilted a little bit, so I'm going to show you how to fix that in a second. So, you know, we just want it as straight as possible. Now, that's how it looks like a butterfly. The last part to this right here is one of my secrets. So my number one secret was how to bend the lines to loop it correctly. My second secret is the epoxy that we put onto the ends of each one of the sleeves that attaches to the cage to keep the loops there for good so they don't move. Now with this, I have tried everything. I tried crazy glue, um, I tried flex glue, I tried the sprays, um, I tried pretty much the commercial grade um, glues and I tried a lot of things. Now when I looked around after trying so many things, what I realized that because I'm dealing with salt water, I had to find something that was oceanic, uh, something that was uh, catered to boats, and something that's waterproof so that way it can hold for a long time now nothing lasts forever again salt corrosion things like that so what i look for and what i found that works well for me again and it works well when it comes to waterproof um dealing with the salt water things like that so before the snare is complete i add epoxy around to those ends to make sure that they stay there and i use um the opportunity while it is drying up to make sure the loops stay where I want them to stay. That is the second secret. So the product that I have that I use, the epoxy that I use is Gorilla Glue. You'd be surprised after I try the $30 kind, the two where you mix them up together and it just don't work out too well. Um, and try other ones, Gorilla Glue. This is probably about a $20 bottle. And this will last you forever. And I made probably about a thousand snares. And then I don't think I'm even halfway done. So this right here, how it works is you apply it and it's a wet coating. Um, and once it dries up, it will foam up. So it expands. You have to keep that in mind because you don't want to lay it too thick because it'll expand thick and you don't want it to expand too much. You just want a light coating around those ends. Again, around these ends right here. Um, you just want a light coating around them and that will expand when it dries up and it will hold the snare in place. Now, sometimes I do two coatings. Sometimes I let it sit overnight and then I'll trim it a little, uh, trim the, um, the gl uh, dry glue a little bit. And then I do another coating just to make sure this right here 
well, make sure your snare works correctly because at the end of the day, um, you know, when it comes to my snares, I don't want my loops to move around. I want them to be stationary. I want them to sit still. There is another snare that I'd make that you the loops are very loose so it moves around so i don't use this but let me tell you i catch more crabs on these snares right here these butterfly loops i catch more crabs on them than any other snare this is my number one seller right here the reason why it's, is because um it can cast out really far there's a lot of space for bait so it attracts the line quality line so they last for a long time and they work very well the craftsmanship is detailed. You see how long it takes and you see all the steps and all the ingredients put in just to make sure that each item, each component is working the way it's supposed to, to work effectively from all angles. Can't get better than that. I'm telling you. So this is my snare. All I do is again, I have the epoxy. Okay. And at the ends, Oh, sorry. So, perfectly. Um, I should have done this on a napkin. Let me get a napkin. But luckily, it dripped right on exactly to where I needed it to drip. So, let's see if I can get a close-up. See how it is right there. And the reason why I'm turning it is because it's dripping down. The blob of drip is, is flowing. So, what I'm doing right now is I'm following that, that drip. And I'm using that drip to coat around the edges of the ends onto the cage. Right, and let me see if I can show you from this angle right here. See that? And I make sure it doesn't pass the sleeve. See that? So I'm following that blob and I'm coating around that sleeve up at the top and the bottom you know and so i'm just following it and i keep turning it turning it following it until it coats that sleeve right there and then i move on to the next one um you know put another one put a blob on there and sometimes you need to apply more, you know, sometimes you apply too much or you wipe it off. Um, I suggested this part right here, use uh, uh, gloves and you're going to thank me later. <laughs> okay. So you're going to see why, but use gloves. I'm not going to use gloves right now because, um, you know, it's hard enough to demonstrate I'm trying to record and everything. So I'm not going to use gloves, but. I recommend you use gloves and again you're going to thank me later trust me on that so i pretty much go in order go around the loops each one of them and i go ahead and put um, the epoxy on them and make sure it's coated all around this takes a little bit of a time in the past you know i'll use like a little stick and i'll rub it on there but again it doesn't apply that coating that i need i want i don't want a very thick coating on there so i don't um i don't squeeze too much on there so it's not too thick but i don't want sporadic coatings either i don't want any gaps i want a perfect thin coating wrapped around the entire sleeve that is attached to that cage and that's going to give me a solid uh, stability where it's not going to move at all so when i move uh, when i pull the crab it's going to snag onto that crab and nothing's going to happen to that line okay the worst crabs that will tear up your lines, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, let me know. Okay, let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. The worst crabs to deal with that will mess up your line so quick, like a brand new line can be messed up just like that. Rock crabs. Horrible. Even the four inch little tiny one will mess up your line just like that. Tell me I'm wrong. So I've done this so long that I could do two and three at uh, two to three loops at a time. So I don't. When I first started out, I only did one at a time, but um, I got so used to it that I could do two, three at a time without spilling. 
Okay, because you don't want to spill. Um, that's why I said wear gloves. Helps you out. But um, again, like right now, I have glue on all three at one time. And the other sides are still dripping. So I have to keep all that in mind. So I'm looking at everything and I'm rotating the snare. So that way it's moving in a direction where it's coating the, uh, the sleeves. But without dripping off. Okay. Now, if the epoxy somehow, let's say, sticks onto this part right here. Your little, um, your little uh, loop, okay, with your spring action. Somehow it gets stuck on that. I don't want you to worry too much. The epoxy, all you do is just peel it, cut it off, peel it off. It'll come off very gently. You don't even have to worry about it. And that's the great thing about this, that it's strong when it bonds. When it touches itself, it's strong. But when on the loose ends, if there's loose ends, you know, it'll crumble off. Um, that's the reason why I would do it this step and make sure that everything's coated correctly, even though it takes a little bit of a time. One of the reasons that makes my snares very strong and last a long time is because I put in the time to make sure that it lasts a long time. Okay? Everything down from the lines, um, quality uh, uh, mesh, Quality cage, quality lead, nice lead, nice lead weight, accurate weight, sturdy leader lines, never snap, never break, never have a problem with the leader lines. You know, uh, the durability of the crimps and the sleeves that we use and the clips that we use to crimp everything together. I mean, these are not the most expensive, the most highest quality, but I use good materials to create a very effective and very high quality product. That is based on experience. So the experience that I gain allows me to create something like that and put it to use, okay? So now, I let it sit and let it dry overnight. Now, here's a trick, okay? This right here, here's the last part to get it straight, even to look nice like this. How do I get it to look nice like this, where it's all even out? The key to this is if it's not already straight and even where it's supposed to be, you can use things like I use other snares that hasn't have loops on it yet. And let's say if this is up too much, I'm gonna put this on top of the loop to make sure that it stays down while it's drying. So that way, when by the time it's dry, it's gonna level out and even, even out. Let's say this loop is down too much, like this. Like it's all the way down compared to everything else. So I'm gonna go ahead and stack it on top like this. So let's elevate it up. Elevate it up so that way by the time I'm done and I take it, it's gonna level out. Okay, let's say and keep in mind this is the heavier end, so you want this close. So you want to make sure that it's in the right position while while it is drying. Okay, so now let's say one of the loops give you trouble, it doesn't stay in place. Take one of these, stick it inside, stick it in that position, and it's gonna stay in place. It's not going the loop is not going to move so it's going to dry in that position okay so that's what you want by doing that your ending result would look like this so here's the snare that i just made so i'm leaving it dry dry it on a cardboard you're going to see why you're going to thank me later so dry it on car uh cardboard um, make it a lot easier later on when you have to trim it down now this right here this loop is popping up a little bit too much so i'm gonna have this hold it down for me during the drying process so when it's done it's going to level out okay so these are the tricks so here's the snare after it dries up from the glue you see, let's take an up close look here. You see how the epoxy foams up after it dries? So that's what I was talking about, it expands. So you wanna keep that in mind while you're coating your crimps. Okay. So when it expands, this is why you wanna put it on cardboard because the epoxy 
get stuck. So you don't want to put on anything that you can damage this. You could just rip it right off. And I'm going to show you the final step on making sure that this is done correctly. So here's an up close look after the glue dries up. And this is what it pretty much looked like. See, that's the cardboard that I got stuck on um, and all the way around. Let's take a close up look at the corners. See, what we want is the epoxy to be able to coat around the crimp that's attached to the cage, but not mess with the loop. Now, it doesn't always work out like that, so I'm going to show you how to fix it. But So we're going to clean this up, okay? And I'll process, grab you some dikes. Grab you some dikes. And what we're going to do is first start with the bottom. And I'm going to get all the bottom, anything that's at the bottom off, and including anything that's stuck to the cardboard. Now, the dikes, they work great if you don't have any. Pliers work too. Get you a set of pliers and just scrape them off. Okay, pull it off. Matter of fact, the pliers probably work a lot better. Okay. See? Now, I, I know you say, wow, if it peels off so easily, how is it so strong in the water? Again, these are the loose ends. How this epoxy works is if it's coated around, let me show you a corner that's coated. When it's coated around like that, this thing is not going anywhere. See? See that? It's staying in place. It's not going to move because it's coated all the way around so there is a strong bond. These right here don't have strong bonds. The ones on the loose ends, they don't have strong bonds because they're not attached to the entire body. So therefore, I can like this one right here. I can see it's not attached to anything else. It's just a blob that fell off. So I can actually take it and just peel it off. But when it comes to the rest of it, it doesn't move. It's strong. Okay. And that's what I love about these things because they are so durable. Um, so you want to continue cleaning it and clean everything off at the bottom. Uh, for me, I take a little bit more effort because I want it to look a little bit nicer. So I try to get 99% uh, of it off. And then after that, I take a look around. I take a look around. I make sure that the springs are not glued in and they can open up. Each one can open up and everything's okay. So I go around, open it up. Now this one right here, take a look. See how the epoxy came close to passing that? And then it almost glued that together. It's okay, that's not a problem, okay? Now it did get on the line a little bit. You see that, uh, this part right here? It's on the line, so all you have to do, just use your nails, scrape it off. And it's gonna pop right off, see that? pops right off and you're good to go see because it's not attached to anything um, keep going around making sure you test out all your loops and make sure everything's okay see that now uh, if anything else seems to be out of place go ahead and do some minor changes now inside take a look that's just a blob it's not connected to anything so I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out Okay. I think this step is very important when it comes to the epoxy because it allows your loops to last a lot longer and it works so much better too. It's I want to say it's at least 50% effective compared to the loops that are just loose and just bouncing around. So once you do that, that's it. You have your snare with your loops. Oh man, we covered a lot of materials today. I mean, we went over everything and I know it's a lot. When I did these videos, I told you guys that, you know, uh, making snares is not as simple as it sounds, especially if you want to make it effective. And for my version, they're not even the most expensive. So these are shortcuts and this is the best quality. So again, it's still a lot of work in it. I imagine if you have the best um, quality and have the money to spurge and use the best materials, imagine how much time and effort you put in just to make that snare. Again, 
This is the best snare at a cheap price. At the quickest, it takes me about 30 minutes to 45 minutes to make a snare uh, from beginning to end. I don't want to make any cheap snares that last only once or twice and that's it. No, I want your snare to last a long time. Check out the rest of my videos to finalize on how to make crab snares and I'm going to make sure they come out before the crabbing season starts. I hope you guys enjoy these videos and I hope you got something out of it. Until next time, peace out.